my name is Jennifer Webb McCray, and if you are a resident of Cumberland County, I am your Cumberland County prosecutor. We're coming to you with another episode of Coping with COVID. It's a series we've been doing during um, this health pandemic that we're all experiencing to let the public know about the services that the Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office provides, as well as services in our community that support health and well-being um, and um, access to services that are still existing during the pandemic. So today I'm here with my trusty agent, Matt Rudd from my office. He's um, my special agent and he's in charge of planning and uh, strategic programming in the office. And he also has become somewhat of the producer of this show. So welcome Matt. And I'm very excited to have um, Detective Dwayne Watkins from my office here as well. Um, welcome, uh, Detective Watkins. Thank you. Thanks for and having me. Detective Watkins works in our Internet Crimes Against Children unit. Yes. Um, but he has a lot of experience with um, computers. He has a computer background. And at this point, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself. So welcome, Detective Watkins. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate taking the time to uh, spend this time with us and a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I've been with the prosecutor's office uh, about 18 years this year. I've worked in pretty much every unit. Um, currently, I'm assigned to the Internet Crimes Against Children unit, which is also part of Special Victims. Uh, one of my uh, also, side assignments, if you will, would be computer and mobile forensics. And as part of the ICAC unit and doing the computer and mobile forensics, unfortunately, I see the worst of what people like to do on their phones and what they uh, use their phones for. Um, and unfortunately, during this time where people have more time on their hands and more time available to be connected to technology uh, and a little bit more time to think about, unfortunately, some of the wrong things, uh, I was glad to get the phone call to uh, help out and, and put this message out there. Well, thank you. And we're excited to have you. Anyway. So um, the first thing I want to talk about two things today. We're going to be talking about how we can keep our kids safe when they're spending more time on their tablets and computers um, because they really don't have much else to do, as well as the, some of the internet scams that everyone in the community should be concerned about um, and uh, be vigilant against um, being taken advantage of during this pandemic. So let's talk about first safety for kids. Um, I want to mention that you do a lot of our presentations in the community and with our schools about internet safety for kids. As kids are spending more time possibly on their computers, supposed to be doing schoolwork and things of that nature, can you talk about the things that parents should be mindful of and that you would warn um, kids if you were speaking with them about how to be safe on the internet? Sure. Uh, first thing is, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to the parents, we have to not trust our kids as much as we think we should. Um, simply because it's not what our kids are doing, it what may be what someone else is doing. And because our kids are so comfortable with spending so much time connected and uh, on their phones and laptops, computers and game systems and everything, they will send and share information that they normally wouldn't tell a regular stranger. So for example, if you were just walking through Walmart or Target, would you walk up to somebody and say, hi, this is my name, this is a picture of my kids, this is my family, this is what I do, this is my spare time, this is what I ate, blah, 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 blah. No, that person would look at you like you were a weirdo. Like, why, why is this guy talking to me? like this and why is he giving me this information um, but at the same point in time that's exactly what we do when we're online because it's just something we don't think about so when we stop to think about how do we keep our kids safe the main thing is, is uh, as the parents is we have to monitor what they do now technology is both good and bad at the same time. The good part is, is because we have the whole world at our fingertips and it allows us to meet face to face, uh, digitally if you will, um, during times of crisis or just over distances to make life easier. But at the same point in time, it can be used for those same nefarious 
uh, purposes nefariously. Um, some trends and scams that we've seen are uh, usually email based or application based. And the email ones, the email based ones, we've heard the term phishing and spear phishing and, you know, um, the Nigerian print scams and things like that. Well, they all prey on our willingness to either want to help somebody or greed or just being nervous or apprehensive about whatever information we have out there. So let me just stop you there for one second, because I do want to get to that with the elderly people and people, you know, just in general who are online. But I want to stay on the topic of kids for a minute because, you know, yeah, I, I agree with you. The scams tend to come by email, but um, I think it's important for the us to talk and highlight how the young people may think they're talking to a peer, someone their age, but they might actually be talking to an adult who is, you know, doing the same thing, help, you know, asking them to help them right. or getting, you know, private information from them so that they can use it against them. So let's stick with that topic for a moment. Can you talk about how internet predators, um, strike up conversations with our young people and how they get them to share more and more private um, information and like basically pull them into a spider web of secrecy where they don't want to tell their parents, you know, what's going on. Right. Sorry. One second. My eye is itching as it is my allergy season. Yes. Yes. So um, what I've seen uh, throughout the, the years is that um, when it comes to our kids, I'll use uh, Facebook and Snapchat, for example. Um, our kids want to be popular online, and it's the thrill of getting that extra like or possibly coming, possibly becoming a viral sensation or, or whatnot. And with some, they will accept as many people into their friends list as possible, and, and others will just have public profiles. Well, if your profile is public, that means anyone can search it and look for it. And if you have... Uh, some truthful information in there, such as your birth date or a, a city that you live in. Sometimes people will look up particular areas or particular age ranges or schools or high schools and things like that, and then see who's available. Uh, some will be as bold as just to send a random message to somebody to say, hey, you know, I think you're cute. You know, let me lo learn more about you or nice shirt or nice shoes or whatever, just something to that, that compliment to get that person interested. Just, and all it takes is just a little bit uh, to, to get somebody to open up and they have a process which is called grooming. And these predators are usually pretty patient. They will take sometimes days up to months and even years to learn every detail about you. And unfortunately, like I said, mentioned earlier is if your profile is public or or uh, you put out so much information that gives them much more information in which to come about you. And then eventually after they get to know you and learn uh, uh, some info about you and they, they uh, get some details about your life, they will begin to use it against you. And it could be anything such as, Hey, well, you know, we've been talking for a while. Why don't you send me something? All right. Well, what do you want? Uh, send me some pictures of you doing this or send me some of this or some of that. And then, it may start off innocent where it's something where you're standing outside in a park and then it eventually progresses to uh, either semi-pornographic or pornographic images or something that can be seen as a pornographic image. Um, and then I've also seen from there blackmailing. It's, well, <clears throat> excuse me, now that I have these pictures and videos of you, you need to send me more or I'm going to release these to your friends, your families, your school, or I'm going to tell this one or tell that one. And they use the embarrassment against uh, a, a lot of kids nowadays. And uh, that is a huge, huge issue. So one thing that I like to uh, go over and remind people is there's a couple of rules that I put in place. Well, the, the first is we have to go back to remembering crossing the street. You look both ways before crossing the street. Well, let's do that when it comes to surfing the internet. One way is, is your information available in public? If it's not great, then we can proceed. You look the other way and you keep going. The other one is, is you have to rely on what I like to call the Nana rule. 
The NANA rule, and for those who've seen my presentations, uh, will be very familiar with it. The NANA rule is named after my grandma. And it essentially goes on to say, if there's something you have to do online, if there's something you have to post or send or share or an image that you want to uh, give to somebody, show NANA. If you don't have a Nana or grandma, you show your mom, your dad, aunt, uncle, anybody, uh, uh, an adult that you can trust, a police officer, a lawyer, it doesn't matter, just show somebody. And if they don't agree with it, or if you think that it will get you in trouble, don't do it. Because of the second rule, when it comes to the internet, anything that goes up doesn't always come down and it can come back to bite you later. I mean, let's look at, you know, um, Schools are looking at your social media profiles to determine whether you are a huge party animal because some schools don't want to take the investment in there. Uh, not to mention if you're going for a good job or something that requires a background check, what's going to come up in your past based upon what you put online? Uh, a lot of our kids don't think about that because they live for the right now. And we, uh, as I said earlier, we have the whole world at our fingertips and everything is so fast with broadband internet and speed everywhere that we simply don't take the time to realize or we don't give it a second thought to teach our kids. You gotta be careful with what you put up there. It, it can come back to bite you. So I really like um, that. Yeah, I like that point because it, it gets, you know, even the analogy of the uh, crossing the street and with young children myself, <clears throat> I've realized that's not a common sense thing, right? They, we think it is, you know, because it's so ingrained in us, but the reality is I've had to repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly teach my children that they need to, cr they need to look both ways before crossing the street. And that same principle should apply to me as a parent that I need to teach them repeatedly about what it looks like to be safe on online and on the internet. And so, you know, it, like you're saying, it just takes time to do that. And we need that reminder. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking of something when you were talking, like we know we teach our kids not to, to talk to strangers yes. and to be wary of strangers, but we know from studies that have been done that little kids, kids that aren't on the internet, they have in their mind a picture of what a scary stranger is. So time and time again, when, when they do studies about this, they will talk to people that they don't, that don't fit their perception of what that scary stranger is because, um, you know, they're, we're naturally trusting beings, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to highlight here for, you know, our young people, our middle schoolers, our teenagers, that you could have that scary stranger, that internet predator who has mm -hmm. the picture of like the cute 19 year old boy up, but he's really the 60 year old guy who's yes. you know, looking for young girls. But even so, in their interactions with their friends and people that they think care about them, they have to follow the same principles. They may yeah. have a, like a guy who they like, a boyfriend. They're saying, that's not a stranger. If he asks for a picture of me topless, you know, I trust him. But that point that you brought up about the fact that um, it's forever. And some things, once they're on the internet, you can never get them down. Because if they go viral, anybody can have a copy of it. Those same, like, look across both ways across the street principles have to be kind of uh, modeled and used in those circumstances as well. So there's, you know, a lot of y uh, things that our young people are facing mm -hmm. that are really hard to navigate. So my next question to you, because we, the three of us all have things in common. We all have children and, and they're varying ages. But Detective Watkins, I want to hear from you as a parent, knowing all the scary things that you know happen on the internet. What are the things that you tell your, you know, middle school, middle school, teenage age kids, or what would you tell them to, and what do you do, not tell them, what do you do as a parent to make sure that you're keeping them safe online? Well, the parent in the, the parent side of me is uh, a little bit strict because of what I see. And I have specific timelines in which they're allowed to use technology. So for example, I know that, you know, uh, my kids have to get up early and start their schoolwork. But at, um, after hours, after school, when all their work is done, they have time to play around and, and hang out with their friends. 
but the, the, the strict line is uh, for my, my high schooler, uh, 8.30 is the cutoff point. You know, no more phone, no more computer, you can take a break. If we're playing games online, we're usually hanging out together. Uh, we're in a, a, even if we're on uh, uh, two separate TVs, um, that's fine because we'll be in the same party room together or whatnot. And um, she's old enough now where she's making uh, better decisions about who to talk to, what not to talk to. So I'm not, uh, not at the, fleet, the, the woods yet, but we're, we're doing good with that. My youngest one, uh, it's still uh, a work in progress because, you know, she's even more comfortable with technology than my high schooler is. So we constantly have to go over things. Well, who are you talking to online? Are you talking to your friends in your classroom? All right, well, what are you saying? What are you talking about? Will what you say to your classmate in this, uh, uh, what do you call these? Uh, drawn chat link. messenger apps. Right yeah, there. chat messenger, all of these things. Um, community boards, will that get you in trouble with your teacher? Will, would, would you fail something because of, you know, uh, something that was said? So we're, we're still learning, working on that. And uh, for the most part, we're doing good. Uh, so I want to ask you a question because I, I'm, I've shared with the public that I have a son who's college age and trade school. But when he was younger, um, before he became an adult, I had this rule. And the rule was, if I pay for it, it's my business. Right. So not that I was, um, you know, on his phone at all time, you know, checking his phone all the time, but yes. we just had a premise in our house that you don't get to not tell me that I don't have the right to take a look at your phone as to who you're talking to or what have you. Yes. And we started that when he was really little and he, you know, he's a good kid. So he never really gave me an issue about it. But, you know, I know parents struggle, like how much autonomy, how much privacy mm -hmm. should we give our kids? Was that too much or is that a good rule of thumb to follow? That's that's the same exact rule that I follow in my house. And uh, my kids know if I'm paying for it, I'm going through it. If it's in my house, I'm going through it. And it's not because of I'm worried about them. It's because I'm worried about the outside world. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit about that dichotomy because I know you've been through many of the units and um, it's, it's something that, that is really, it's real for kids and it's something that we have to have parent to kid conversations about. If someone other, you know, than a parent, if anyone says to a child, it's our secret. If you tell, you know, if you tell anybody, I'm gonna hurt your mom, I'm gonna mm -hmm. hurt your dad. Um, how, how can we talk to our kids about that and tell them that there's nothing that they can't tell a safe, trusted adult or a safe, trusted teacher if they're being harmed or hurt? Well, the, my recommendation would be to approach the scenario, if possible, before anything even happens. So what you have to let your child understand is that even if they're not comfortable talking to you that they... It, you know, for example, there are things my daughters will talk to mama about and won't say a word to me. And I'm fine with that because at least they're talking to mama. So how I approach it, and I'll let them know, say, look, you, if you want to talk to me, you can. If something's bothering you, you can come to me. If not, you have your mama or you have somebody you can go to. And that's exactly what they do. If it's not mama, it could be grandparents. Uh, you know, it could be nana. Um, if something has already happened, uh, there have been situations in, in actual cases where um, I've had victims whom I did not know prior to actually come to me and want to talk to me simply because of how we approach the situation. Maybe you know, after a presentation or something like that? Yes. You know, it would be something. And the, the, the main thing is you, you're your approach and perception is, is everything. You know, you can't be, you know, overly uh, energetic about it. It has to be a calm situation. If not, you know, they're going to close up. Let's face it. Would you want to talk to somebody who's loud, boisterous, and in your face about something personal and private? Nobody does. Yeah. So, you know, as a, as a parent, I'm, I want you guys to chime in because I'm not an expert at this. This is just something that, you know, I try hard at. I always had, you know, a mantra with my son that 
I don't care what he's ever done. He can tell, tell me and we'll fix it. We'll try to fix it, fix it mm -hmm. as best we can. And that, um, you know, my role as his parent, and I do this with my grandchildren as well, is to keep them safe. And, and anything that's happened, we can address and deal with, but, but the paramount thing is to keep them safe. Um, and, you know, we've had this theme in, in a couple of our other sessions, you know, as children are home, um, some children are home in situations where there's abuse and neglect. So the conversation really is a community conversation about trusting adults and who they can talk to about, um, about issues that harm them or hurt them. Right. And, and, um, and, and I'm sorry to cut you in, off. And, yeah, we and, want to bring that into the internet safety world as well. Okay. In Go that ahead. same vein, there may not always be an adult in which they can talk to. So sometimes I encourage them to find a, a, a close friend whom they can trust, uh, a cousin, somebody who can relay a message. Because let's say it is a case of abuse where it's somebody in the household and you're too afraid to go to anybody else in the household because you don't know what the consequences would be. Find somebody outside that you can vent to as well uh, to get that information. Yes. So I had, I, I I had two thoughts. Go ahead. I, yeah, I, I had two thoughts in particular, and, and it goes to um, both sides of this. And one of, one of the things is that um, more so from, from the side where it's not necessarily an, a, a situation where the child can't trust an adult, but it's more speaking to the parents and the adults that need to have kind of the, the encouragement or empowerment, like you were saying, if you own the equipment or you own whatever it is, it's, it's your responsibility as the adult to make sure that that's using, being used appropriately. And, and the first thought is um, there, there's crimes that are being committed, right? Like there's, there may, the child may not actually realize that there's a crime that's happening that that's, needs to be dealt with. And you as the parent, you have uh, some element of liability in that. So you're actually protecting, but you're also, um, you're checking for the, the purposes of, of um, making sure that whatever crime is being committed can be put a stop to as soon as possible. Um, the second thing, and this is more of kind of my own parenting style, and, and there's like a little mantra in my head, and you know, there's a thousand different things that are happening every day, and there's a levels of exhaustion that kind of make, make it um, difficult to parent. Um, and the little mantra is Goya like the beans, like G-O-Y-A. -G um, and so, uh, which stands for get off your ASS <laughs> parenting, right? Which for me, that is like that little like, okay, I don't want to deal with this, but I, I need to. Like, this is what it means to be a parent. This is how I need to, you know, to, to go after it. So Goya, you know, kind of like go, get, go after it in terms of the parenting aspect and check the, check the browser history you know, set up the permissions on, on YouTube um, so that the explicit filters are turned on. And, and some of those things that are necessary that take that kind of intentionality. But if you don't, the, the, the consequences can be devastating and do that early and often, right? And that's the kind of applying the Goya principle to, to the parenting aspect here and, and um, using that to protect and care for your children. Yeah, and I think that can't be overstated because – you know, we have a responsibility to, to keep them safe. And as, as smartphones become more prevalent, I'm seeing people giving smartphones to five and six year olds. Yes. And as parents, we, we have an obligation to ask, is our child smart and or is our not even smart enough? Is our child mature enough to handle mm -hmm. the responsibility that comes with a communication tool that gives them access to the world? And yes, um, I know because I bought tablets for my grandbabies who are uh, four and five that you can put all kinds of, um, you know, safeguards on the tablets so that it's only age appropriate stuff, but you're only making them more savvy and possibly, you know, getting them ready earlier for a world that they really aren't prepared for. So we, I, I think the things you said and, the, and then what uh, Detective Watkins said about you know, making sure we're, when our kids are using technology, it's in common areas, um, mm -hmm. not after hours, late at night, when we know some of the crazy, scary things happen. Not that it can ha can't happen all times of the day, but, you know, setting up uh, 
norms in your home mm -hmm. where they they know you know that they're not supposed to be on their phone at two o'clock in the morning texting things like that yes so um one one question i want or one thing i actually would like for you to talk about because i don't think the general public knows too much about this can you talk about like the the organizations that are out there that assist us in Sure. In internet crimes and child pornography and things like that without talking about the details and our techniques because we don't want to give any of the of the the um, perpetrators information about how we do what we do can you just talk about the fact that we have a lot of resources to help us sure can do um, I'll, I'll cover about two or three uh, the, the first is is um, being part of the ICAC unit the ICAC task force uh, it's part of the state police uh, ICAC task force. Tell them and, what ICAC stands for. Sure. The ICAC is the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. And it's a national task force and it's growing to be international as well. But ours in New Jersey is headed by the state police. And of course, each um, prosecutor's office and police department then will have a liaison for it and whatnot. Uh, in addition to the ICAC task force, we work closely with NECMEC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, and they have agreements with basically all the major websites, all of your large traffickers and all of your um, internet service providers. And anytime there is contraband material that's being trafficked or sent back and forth, uh, notifications get sent and reported left and right, and then it gets filtered down and pushed down to myself and my uh, constituents. Mm -hmm. And uh, suffice to say, the, the long or short is, is pretty much if, uh, most of your internet traffic is monitored one way, shape, or another. Uh, and and the even, reason we, if you can just share, the reason we're doing that is that we don't want images of children to be on the internet and exploit it and what right. have you because, you know, we know that that promotes more child pornography. Yeah. The reason that we, we have these partnerships with agencies like that is so that, um, you know, child pornography is not, prevalent on the internet because we know that can promote more child pornography and a, and a larger um, market yes. for it. So, yes, and, and unfortunately it is a massive issue because like we've mentioned before how comfortable our children are using technology. So yes. we'll have an application such as Snapchat and there are others like it where people think that oh well these messages and images and videos will disappear. Uh, I'm going to take this and then in two seconds or 20 seconds or hours, it'll go away. But there's always ways around things and people find ingenious ways to save these images and to chatting them. Right. right. The videos. Well, and, and I, you know, I've even heard re crazy reports, so not mentioning the cloud, you know, at all, but the cloud is one aspect, but even, you know, phone repair shops oh, where, yeah technicians were, you know, they were going, they were downloading all the pictures and looking for anything that was scandalous or could be, um, you know, sexualized. Those are, you know, other aspects. So whenever a phone is out of your possession too, that, you know, creates a dangerous aspect. Yes. Uh, there was a, a story a few years ago where there was a, a guy who ran a Mac mm -hmm. repair yeah. shop. He was uh, repairing phones and Macs and installing his own homemade software on them. And then he would use that to uh, record at random times, uh, videos and uh, of wow. the people he was uh, doing repairs for. And the way he wow. got caught was there was a female, she was taking a shower and she noticed that uh, the record light on her phone went off and she didn't have a video recording. She immediately uh, turned the phone off, called the police, and then you know they eventually got him, the uh, repair wow. technician. So this stuff does happen. So one thing we always say is that um, when we do these uh, recordings, we always try to put um, resources in the comments. So mm -hmm. once I um, once this airs, I will make sure that we have uh, the resources that we mentioned during this uh, program in the mm -hmm. comments. So uh, Detective Watkins mentioned the New Jersey ICAC Task Force. They have a wonderful... Facebook page where they have a lot of information. What do parents have? What should parents know about Facebook? What should parents know about YouTube? What parents should know about Snapchat that I often share on our page, our Facebook page, but you can get all of those resources by going to their Facebook page. So I'm going to share that. And I will share some of these other resources that, um, 
Detective Watkins has talked about. Um, so now I want to pivot a little bit and I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you're seeing, the crimes, internet crimes that you're seeing with just the general public, which could apply to kids as well, mm -hmm. but the scams um, that people are doing right now because they're taking advantage of the vulnerability that people are feeling with um, the COVID pandemic. So um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and some of the scams you're becoming aware of? All right, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because there's just so many. No, uh, I understand. The ones I've seen coming up con concerning the pandemic will be messages related to it. It'll say, click here for more information. And then when you click on a link, it doesn't go to a reputable source. It may go to some third party website, uh, which looks legitimate, and which may look similar to a legitimate website, but will uh, install software in your background. And simply by clicking on it, you're giving your, uh, you're, you're giving your, the, the, the website access to download and install. So if you see something that quickly comes up and flashes and it says, well, press here to uh, to install such and such or, or virus scan or malware. I mean, malware and uh, virus scan software, they're, I won't say old news because they're still around, but anything, anytime something asks you to click on a particular link for additional information, hold your mouse over the link and see if the link in the text matches the link that you're supposed to be going to. Uh, the other way would be to manually type into your web browser uh, into the address bar, the link, or the main website of which you want to go to. So let's say it's the um, consumer protection page. You know, it's you go to njconsumeraffairs.gov, and then type you type it in and go to your particular link rather than simply just click on a link that somebody sends you. Uh, that's one of the, the easiest ways. It keeps, it keeps it from redirecting or something, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, so, well, like this is a big one and, and it's amazing how many people still fall for it, but we get pounded in our head by IT all the time. Is anybody going to be asking you for your pa password or your financial information by email or text? Um, I may ask in person because, no, I'm not going to ask in person, <laughs> but for the most part, no one should ever ask for that through email or text. The only time you should get a notification about your account would be if you reset your password and they're sending a, a follow-up notification, or let's say your account might have been compromised and they're letting you know. But if they say in that message, click here to update, no, don't do that. If let's say Amazon sends you an email to say your account has been compromised, go to Amazon's website, type it into your address, then attempt to log in and then find out. Or you can go old school and call them over the phone and find out. Uh, but never click on any links that says your account's been compromised, click here to update. Because it's very easy to uh, spoof a website and copy graphics and images to make uh, a fake website to collect data and information. Um, right. So. Um, just so that we can talk a little bit to our elderly people, because they seem particularly vulnerable to the email scans, mm -hmm. give them three tips. And it doesn't have to be like, I, I'm talking about tips like don't trust, you know, the foreign princess, that kind of thing. Yes. Give them three tips that they should, they should take away from this video to keep them safe from internet scams. Um. We already know all about the, the Nigerian prince, and, and you'd be surprised how many people still fall for that. Uh, when it comes to the, the older generation, the, the, mo the most trusting generation is, unfortunately, we have to go against the grain. You got to be skeptical and not trust everyone. And at that point, I even say, not even really your kids in some area. So if they're asking you for account information, well, why do you want my account information? Ask as many questions as you can possibly think about. Get as much information as you possibly can before you give out any kind of, kind of information. Um, some people like to, to, to push false information as well, so definitely check resources. Uh, like we mentioned with clicking on links, 
if somebody tells you to go to a certain place and you're kind of iffy about it, you know, there are, you can, you can check websites based on a, a company. So if somebody says, go check out, you know, the NJ task force or the ICAC task force, well, you can definitely just a couple minutes on Google will give you all the information you need. Uh, I think your Nana rule yes. is probably a good rule as well. And it won't be the Nana rule with our elderly people. It might be mentioning it to their kids mm -hmm. because one thing I'm seeing a lot of uh, Detective Watkins, and I know you see it in your work, is that the scammers create such a false sense of urgency mm -hmm. in terms of saying things like, um, oh, your, your son is in jail and we need to bail him out. I need you to send me this money order immediately. Yes. You can't go to the police because blank or what have you. Right. So they create a sense of false urgency. And because sometimes our elderly are more trusting, that kind of takes away from their discernment, so to speak. Yes. And the ironic part is I've had something like that happen in my family where a relative of mine got a phone call and said, well, your, your, your cousin was just arrested. We need to bail him out. And if you send us this gift card, we'll have him bailed out in two to three hours. And so they called me and said, this doesn't sound right. And I said, well, what jail would be asking for a gift card? So I said, you're right to call and I will definitely follow up and help out. And then of course we called the office in which they were supposedly arrested by and they knew nothing about it. I said, well, I already know simply because they're asking for gift cards, but I'm, and I'm glad you didn't just go ahead and send it. So this stuff does happen, whether it's through phone calls. Yeah, or, uh, we know. actually had a trick an even trickier one that mm -hmm. what didn't end up so well. And that was a, a family friend who, whether the person knew because it was, uh, you know, like the spear phishing, they had found out the information that their son was traveling, um, but he was actually traveling in Latin America. And um, the scammers called and brought urgency and said, but it wasn't gift cards. They said you needed to Western Union the money. Mm -hmm. um, she couldn't get a hold of her son who was who was traveling um and abroad and in doing you know out of the urgency and the fear um, she actually did wire the money and it was a few hundred dollars i think it wasn't even that much money but it was um in her mind she was weighing the risks of if he's actually in trouble and these are he's being held for ransom she it was worth it to her to do it right. um which is still sad because she couldn't verify it right because that's kind of the the rule of check both you know look both ways before you cross the street is try to verify that information um, but that sense of urgency, like the prosecutor says, is, is exactly what they're using. Yes. Um, and I also think this is probably a good time to bring up because the FBI specifically have come to us and said that there is a high count of what they call money mules in yes. Cumberland County. And especially in the context of social distancing where people feel isolated and they feel lonely, they're using romance as a way to get people to um, essentially launder money or process fund funds that are coming from one place that they want to get to another and they're using people's um their isolation and their loneliness to do that and these are people that are smart they're, these yes. are people that are educated but what they're doing um cre preys on whatever vulnerability that that person has um and and they said Cumberland County in particular is being targeted for these kinds of, of schemes. Um, it's not just a scam. It's actually a scheme because the person in this case didn't lose money. They were funneling money through and washing the money um, as, a, as, a, as a way to do that through that person in the romance fraud or money mules. Um, so this is probably a good place. They put out a publication yeah. on this so we can make sure we link to that. So yeah. some of the things that I'm, I'm seeing, um, if someone tells you you have to spend money to make money, it's probably a scam. I've had the experience with my own son where he was applying for a job and he was contacted by someone who said that they had a book company and that they were going to send him like a $2,000 check to um, get started for these books, but they had that he had to cash the check and give the money back to the company. And I explained to, um, you know, my son, that that's a scam and to be concerned about that. We've also had 
senior people targeted, you know, and people, they, they, they say, okay, seniors, they're retired. They may have, you know, an IRA or, or account like that. And they'll call and they'll say, oh, you have tax issues and you have to take care of this and it has to be taken care of immediately. And we need you to go out and we need you to get money orders. And they create this sense of urgency where the person feels like they have to do it right away. So um, that's why I think it's so important that I don't know what we would call it. it wouldn't be the Nana rule, but it would be like tell a trusted friend rule that um, there's always time to check it out. Um, whether you're calling you're right. the U.S. Embassy if you have a loved one traveling, follow the money. Calling your local police department and just put, giving them the scenario so they can give you some advice. Yeah. There's always time to check it out. Yes. Uh, I, I did just get uh, reminded of one of the other rules that we have instituted in our house when it comes to cell phones. Sorry to jump back and forth. That's okay. Uh, but my wife, she's a few rooms over and she, she's listening in and she said, uh, we also, the follow-up rule is there's no cell phones in bathrooms or bedrooms. Ah, good one. And uh, I can't believe I, I've slipped my mind, but yeah, that, that's a major one right there. That kind of goes with the one you shouldn't be on your phone texting at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, when you said right. two o'clock in the morning, I had a case recently where uh, it was uh, an eight-year-old kid who was online and he was talking to his friends back and forth at two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, well, I'm thinking to myself during this whole case, what, what, what does an eight year old need to talk about at two o'clock in the morning? Right. So, and yeah. we know that people that know like those games that they play Fortnite, the different things, we know that that's where the predators go to find our kids. Yes. And we know that our predators go to the elderly people who are maybe not as savvy with technology. And then they talk about things like IRA accounts and tax consequences and things about, you know, they're in danger of not following rules because they, they know those are the trigger points yes. for our elderly um, community. And to say, oh, well, this part of your house is need, it needs an emergency repair or insurance type claims. Oh, well, this is going to fall apart. This is expiring. Now, how many times a day have we received phone calls, uh, robot calls about, your car's warranty. Oh my gosh. On my work phone. <laughs> all the time. Yes. Yes. So these all go into account is uh, because somebody falls for it. These, these techniques work because they're, they're, they're going after our, our basic needs to want to take care of business. Oh, oh right. well, I forgot about my warranty. What do I do? Well, there you go. So, um, one of the uh, things that you may not know we did, we did a, a similar type of program such as this, coping with COVID with Jim Matlock, who is our Director of Consumer Affairs. So I can see that, and I know, and I share that we work together with his office a lot because a lot of the crimes that we're dealing with are not local crimes. They're not people here in Cumberland County when we're dealing with the internet scams. They're, they could be anywhere in the country or in the world, yes. which make them that exponentially harder to address and, and solve and prosecute. Um, so people need to be mindful of that because um, oftentimes we're in a reporting mode, we're in a um, damage control mode when we're dealing with victims of these type of crimes so that it doesn't mm -hmm. continue to happen. Yes. Um, but it's oftentimes very hard to prosecute because of the jurisdictional issues and because it's just happening so often um, that it's it's hard to hard to address. But I do want the public to know, and we will put these comment these uh, resources in the comment that we do have the Office of Consumer Protection, mm -hmm. New Jersey Consumer Affairs um, Office, and there is actually a New Jersey Consumer Affairs COVID-19 resource page, which has some information about the scams and things that are going on that people need to be aware of. And if you are not our Facebook friend on our Cumberland County Prosecutor's Office Facebook page, I invite you and encourage you to just like our page because oftentimes when we hear about new scams, we put that information up on our Facebook page. So, um, in wrapping up, do you have any closing comments, Detective Watkins, that you just want to share with the general public about internet safety? Yes, uh, five small things, and I'll go through them very quickly because I know I can get a little long-winded. First one is take a break. 
you know, we're connected 24 seven. Now uh, we seem to forget that we can disconnect at some point in time, reset your mind and don't rely on technology to help you rest, turn it off, get a break. Uh, number two, uh, just like the email that was just sent throughout the entire County was clean your technology. If your tech goes with you everywhere, wipe it off, clean it. You know, since it's, we're, we're constantly told, wash your hands, wash your hands. Well, wash your tech because it's always in your hands and don't use a washcloth or a rag that's dripping wet. Make sure it's dry or slightly damp and then wipe everything down. Uh, number three, since we have a little bit more extra time on your hands, learn a new skill. Uh, keep your brain active. That doesn't require you to press a button constantly unless you're learning programming or something like that. But uh, now's the perfect time, you know. And uh, one of my big ones is patience. Uh, we're so rushed since we have the entire world at our fingertips. Slow down, enjoy, take a deep breath. When you, when you turn off the technology and you slow down, you take a look at everything, you realize, oh, wow, that, that's pretty nice. You know, I, I like to look out my window and watch birds, which is one of my slow things. And last but not least, be grateful and thankful because things could be far worse than what they are. And um, just enjoy the time you have because we don't know what tomorrow brings. Well, what's interesting about all of your tips are that you're a guy who works with technology all day long. All day. And a lot of your tips were getting off technology. Yes. 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 Because if, uh, and the funny part is I'm on tech from the time I wake up to almost the time I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I just have to take a day or so just to decompress completely. Um, not only that, there are certain health issues, whether it revolves around carpal tunnel or nerve damage in your wrists and fingers based upon uh, just pressing buttons or even your posture and your neck getting messed up from slouching over. So your body has to recover from using this stuff as well. Yes. So um, in closing, I'm going to give you some tips. And these are tips for our kids. Yes. Um, don't give anyone your password, your name, your address, the name of your school, or any information about your family. Without, and If I may go along with that, if you are posting, let's say you have a social media profile, any pictures that you upload, sometimes you have to think about what's in the background. You don't want people to know what school you're in? Well, don't take a picture near your school or with the school. Right. Um, don't talk to strangers on the internet and you, and people who you think aren't strangers may be strangers. Don't agree to meet anyone in person that you've met online. That's a big no, no. Don't fill in a, pro, a, a profile that asks for your name and address without your parents permission. Uh, don't visit a chat room without your parent or an adult's permission. Don't say, Stay online if you see something that your parents won't like. That's the Nana rule. Don't post pictures of yourself without your parents' permission. And that, and that would get, you know, we'd have to modulate that as our kids get older, but it's a good rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. Do not download or install anything on your computer without your parents' permission. We heard Detective Watkins talk about if you click on links, those links sometimes or activate things in the background of your computer that can be used against you to take pictures and take your personal information. If you have any questions about anything that you read or that you're faced with on the internet, talk to your parents or your guardian. That's the Nana rule. And finally, if you're talking to someone online and they make you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to talk to them. You can cut the conversation off and our recommendation to you would be to tell a parent or trusted adult, follow the Nana rule. So mm. it all goes back to the Nana rule. Um, with that said, Matt, do you have anything you'd like to say? I think you've summed it up great. I do like those aspects of, of look both ways, be vigilant and verify stuff. So a lot of critical thinking here, stuff that you know you need to be skeptical. So be critical in your thinking and, and uh, you'll go a long, a long ways. Yes. So I want to thank Detective Watkins for being here with us today. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you, Matt. I'm Jennifer Webb McCray, and this is Coping with COVID, uh, Dealing with Internet Safety. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.